Welcome to the June 13th Board of Education meeting. Please take a moment to silence your cell phone and then join me in the Pledge of Allegiance. Pledge of Allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Mr. Hatfield, can you take roll for us, please? Yes, sir. Uh, President Rausch? Here. Vice President McFarland? Here. Secretary Hatfield is here. Treasurer Lauterbach? Here. Member Blazy? Here. Member Ringgold? Present. Member Horowitz? Not here yet. All right. That takes us to item two, Board of Education Matters. This is the uh, Truth in Taxation. Presentation to the board. Uh, 2.14 information uh, presentation to the board for the 24-25 general operating budget and tax rates. Brian. Thank you. Thank you, board members. I appreciate the opportunity to present to you the 24-25 um, predicted budget. And for a point of clarity, we are just a touch um, of a degree different than how we've traditionally done this in the past. Um, our past practice has been that we've had a board meeting at the beginning of the month, and we've had another board meeting during the third week of the month, and that first board meeting served as a truth and taxation hearing. As we discussed at the last Board of Education meeting, um, we had to vary from that a touch because of a delay in some of the reports that were needed to present the tax rates that you're going to see this evening. So we appreciate um, that variance. We appreciate you hanging in there with us. But I also will note um, that this is the way that most of the school districts in the state do it, is just in one meeting. So the orientation that you're getting this evening is something that is most uh, traditional out there amongst our colleagues. And if it's something that you like a bit more, it may be a practice that you wish to continue into the future. So this is serving as your truth in budget and taxation hearing. Once I get through presenting the rates in the first reading of the budget, then um, President Roush will open it up for comment. I will reiterate the tax rates for it. Then we'll have comment and then we'll move into action items on these later in the agenda. So tonight, you will get the first reading of the 24-25 budget, you'll get our tax rates, and you will also, later on in the agenda, get our final revision of the current school year's budget as well, too. So with that said, we start with our traditional disclaimer slide. Disclaimer number one, uh, I'm sorry to report to you that we still do not have a budget that is finalized from the state, and there are not any whispers of one coming anytime soon. We believe that there's probably going to be a brisk touch to the air um, when we actually get the budget. Um, we don't see anything that is going to come to us um, anytime in the very near future. There is a pretty major hang up out there between the three branches right now, and it has to do with how they're going to try and deal with the full funding of portions of the retirement plan that I'll hit on a little bit later. There's some major disagreement on that, and because of that, they're at a touch of a stalemate. So, We've had to take the three plans. We've had to center in on our predictions and point in the middle of them, and that's what you see tonight are simply those predictions. So what we present to you tonight can be great until they come out with their actual budget. Then, of course, we'll have to come back with you with an amendment. Um, the other thing that's important is to point out is bullet number two. The amount of variance that we capture in our audit is going to change the fund balance numbers that you're going to see tonight. So when I say our fund balance prediction is this dollar amount, this percentage, that's going to be good for about another three weeks. And then once Yo and Yo shows up, once they go through our books and they know what the final number is for our fund balance, everything I presented to you this evening is going to change as well, too. Know that I typically present to you conservative numbers because I always want them to look better in the end rather than worse. With the note in third bullet that a 1% variance for us now because of the size of our budget is about $1.1 million. So if we are off even by 1% in our prediction and fund balance, that can swing your final numbers by over a million. While seven figures sounds big, in the context of our $111 million budget, a million dollars is within a percent or two. And then finally, the budget that you are seeing here in this reading does not include fund modifications, meaning that this budget does not show transfers to capital improvements. Later in the agenda, when I show you our final revised 23-24 budget, that will show our final fund modification. It will show you how much we're transferring from our revenues this year into capital improvements. This doesn't include it. We traditionally do that at the final amendment of the year. 
Those are our disclaimers. With that, let's get into some numbers. So here's our first reading of our millage rates for the year. Um, again, thank you to our voters for reauthorizing our operating millage, which has two components to it for the year. Those two components are our non-homestead, which as stated in the ballot language and in many of our talks with the public is 18 mils. Our hold harmless rate, during all of the um, talks that we have with the public, we said that this rate is typically historically decreasing. If you are really good in your memory, you'll remember on the ballot language that our previous rate was 0 0.4531 mils. After we got all of our reports from the state, did our fancy calculations, our assessed rate this year has come out to 0 0.3885 mils. Again, that's a formula based on property values, the number of students that we predict, and we can collect $122 per student for, for um, that full harmless rate. And finally, for our um, building and site bonds that were passed in 2015, the same assessed rate that has been in since inception, and that is 2.95 mils. Later on in the agenda, we're going to ask you to officially approve these rates but for the city of Midland only, because in the city of Midland, we collect half of these rates for summer taxes. We do the second half of the city of Midland in the winter, and then in all of the out county districts, we do the full assessment in the winter. So these are the millage rates that will support the budget we're presenting to you this evening. Um, just wanted to throw this chart out there to reiterate our hold harmless rate. Again, this has historically been decreasing over time. I am not going to make a promise to everyone um, that it will continue to decrease always. But again, because of the way that the formula is set up and because we're capped at $122 per student, we anticipate that as time progresses, you're going to continue to see this rate fall, touches, as long as enrollment stabilizes and as long as our property values are at the current rates that they are as well, too. So here is our prediction for the evening. We've taken the three budgets. We've taken the executive, the House, and the Senate, and we are going to come in conservatively at a $250 per pupil foundation increase. That would mean for us $9,980 per student. We know that we're gonna net another $120, $122 per student for our old harmless rate. Um, enrollment continues to be predicted as stable. Um, when you're dealing with around 7,357 students, a drop of 35 students to us is right in that stable part. Um, kindergarten continues to be the hot point for us to be able to predict because late enrollments in kindergarten seem to be a more increasing trend. Um, Jeff and I and Penny stare at these numbers daily. We look at them and say, come on, keep coming. Um, and then our predecessors will say, just wait until late July and August and you will get a boom of kids coming. Um, so we are watching those numbers very close, but when we look at the projections that we paid our consultants for and looking at our current trends, we are predicting a drop of 35 students from what our 23-24 blended count was. Again, every single student needs dollars, so once you look at your enrollment, your state foundation, we start to take a look at how those revenue sources are actually playing out. I won't spend too much time here, um, but this is a historical slide that if I don't show it, Bob Cooper will find me one day when I walk past his house and give me a bop in the back of the head because it was always important for Bob to be able to point out that the full foundation allowance comes from many places. It comes from the state, but it also comes from our non-homestead assessment, and he always wanted to keep the slide here to show how important our non-homestead assessment is. Of the $9,980, $2,711.29 per student comes from that, which is why it was so important for us to be able to get that initiative passed. For the second time, thank you to our voters. And Bob, I did it again for you because I know that he says that's important, and we'll keep that going because in 10 more years, we want to make sure that people understand the importance of where that money comes from. Um, our enrollment, it's important to always take a big picture of that. We were always um, pointing out to the slide that had happened from the early 2000s until about the 2012-2013 era. Um, that is when the budget got really tight around the public schools. We were dealing with declining enrollment. We were dealing with either stagnant or decreasing revenues from the state. During that time, that's when you saw school closures, difficult decisions. And then we had a period of stabilization. COVID came, rocked every school district's world in the state. And you can see that we've gone back to more of a stable pattern after that as well, too. Okay. Major bullet points. I tried to narrow it down to the very, very big points for you. And I know that your eyes get big when you look at this, but I'll go slowly through them. Here's for revenues, the major points for you. ESSER 3 and 11T 
are now gone in the next budget. All the money has to be spent by September. And so built into this budget this year was approximately 5.5 million. Those revenues are wiped out of next year's budgets and they will not be there. 31A continues to be a valuable source for us. We are gonna rely heavier on that funding now that the ESSER 3 and 11T dollars are out there. All budgets showed an increase in 31A funding. So we're anticipating about $3.3 million to be available. The My Kids Back on Track grant, we actually applied for that last year, deferred the revenue, and we'll fund next year's summer school. So you'll see an additional three quarters of a million come into our budget for that. 31AA continues to be a source of frustration for us in terms of knowing if these dollars are gonna be here or not. They're starkly different in all three budgets. And I do believe that depending on how they plan to deal with this little retirement issue they have going on, this could be one of those sources that fluctuates wildly. We guessed at 90% because two of the budgets had it there. One of it had it at 50. So we're gonna cross our fingers and hope that those dollars come back to us. If they don't come back to us in 31 AA, but they do come back to us as unrestricted funds through a retirement offset, I'm not gonna be upset about that. Unrestricted is always better than restricted funds because it allows us the discretion to use those without some of the red tape wrapped around it. All of our title grants, one, two, and four, we always build those at 85% of the previous year. That's what the government promises us we're gonna get. We don't know our full allocations until the winter. Another very variance from this year is we are not building in our CTE equipment funding yet into the budget. We don't get those numbers until around Halloween. This year we received around $650,000, but the ESA will not know those allocations and be able to give them to us into the fall. So we didn't want to take a guess. Uh, once we know, we'll bring that during the budget amendment. Other items, such as the educator compensation grant, those are not included in any of the budget, so we eliminated those. That was one-time money, about $350,000. And then I put two red asterisks next to the bottom two because these are things that can have a material impact on your budget moving forward. The retirement offsets. We've left them as they were this year. I'm gonna spend 60 seconds and no more um, on this because we can go down rabbit holes. There are two portions of the retirement system that have to be funded, the healthcare portion and your actual pension portion. The healthcare portion, according to the actuaries, is now fully funded. The amount that the district has to contribute to that is where the legislatures are playing. We would like those to no longer have to be contributed and those savings get realized right to the district. If those savings get realized by the district, we're at about a $1.8 million estimate of pure savings in our budget. Whereas certain budgets that are proposed keep the contributions the same and divert the money to other categoricals. We would prefer they don't get diverted to other categoricals and become restricted. We prefer that those become straight savings for the schools, allowing us the discretion to do what we want to. Petty can forge you advocacy um, lines, um, letters that you can write to our legislators to push in that direction. We left them the same because we don't know what's gonna happen, but know that if that changes, it'll get some numbers going in different directions in our budget. The other piece that we're pretty firm on is the UAAL rates, the unfunded actuarial accrued liability rates. This is a pretty significant drop to about 11.5%. This drop um, is gonna save Midland Public Schools about 1.6 million, but save is a contextual world word. It's just in out money. It's money that comes to us that I have to write a check back to them. And so when I say savings, you will see decreased revenues of about 1.6 million, and decreased expenditures of about 1.6 million. All that does is take your fund balance percentage and make it wonky, which is why I've always said percentages are weird because of things like this. Those are our large revenue projections. I usually only show you one of these pie charts, but I figured I'd throw two on the slide just to have a little bit of fun this year. If you've got great eyes and you can look at the different shades of blue, you're gonna see that there's one significant variance in our general fund revenues and that's the amount of federal dollars. That shouldn't surprise you based on what I've just said. When we have 5.5 million ESSER, three and 11 T dollars expiring, you'll see that we have a drop in about 4% in our federal revenues. The rest pretty much mirrors the way that it's done before. You're seeing that we're projecting revenues conservatively at about $1.45 million. 
This is a drop from the amendment that I'm going to present to you later of about 9.7 million. That's not something to get um, very worked up about because of that $9.7 million drop in revenue, 5.5 was S3 and 11T, 1.6 was you drop in UAAL, et cetera. So the biggest portion of that are some are in out dollars and some were dollars that we were expecting to drop anyway. Brian, why doesn't the 21% on that pie chart line up with the 29% on the non-homestead tax collection that we saw in the Bob Cooper table? I'm gonna have to take a quicker look at that. I'll get back to you, Phil. Okay. Okay. Just we'll shift over to expenditures. We do a build our budget process, which means we meet with every single building. We meet with every single department. And this year, the allocations that were requested for 24-25 were approximately 9% over what the allocations were in 23-24. Um, it's important to note that that 9% and those allocations usually get the most attention in budgets, but that 9% comes from only the 15% of the budget that is actual supplies and departmental line items. 85% of our budget continues to be salaries and benefits. All of our employees are going to be getting salary increases year over year. Step increases that are contractual and also handbook mandated are occurring as well too. Two more asterisks for you. 7% increase in medical is our guess. We're hearing some interesting rates coming out across the state because of increases in drug prices, increases in usage. Some of those very interesting increases that we've heard usually come from pools that are smaller than Midland Public. So we don't think that we're gonna get hit as hard. So we're gonna come in at 7% and hope that we're right on the money there. And we've talked a lot about that UAL rate decrease. And while that is also a loss of revenue, it's offset by loss in expenditures as well too. We have to continue to contribute contractually to our employees' health savings accounts. It's important to note, and you saw this in your budget narrative, that our staffing levels have been maintained. The increased levels that were there at ESSER 3 and 11T continue to be in this budget. They're being funded through deferred revenues. That was from the presentation that Kim and I gave you last meeting. We talked about our federal allocations being at 85%, and retirement rates were only predicting to go up about 0.2%. That's a weighted average amongst all the different employee plans. And of course, staffing patterns, they change daily. We continue to monitor those and try and adjust those based on enrollment and based on the needs that are identified in our schools improvement plans. For our expenditures, we're predicting around $110.9 million. This is the chart that I included for you a couple of years back, Phil. I'll continue to keep it in there as long as you'd like to see it. Um, you have heard the phrase, and it came out a lot in the superintendent interviews, your budget reflects your priorities. And within the budget, you can see the pie chart breakdown. And when you are looking at classroom instruction and student supports and instructional supports, that makes up over three quarters of your budget. And you can see some of the other small slivers about administration, the support services, maintenance, athletics, et cetera, et cetera. And that's also reiterated back in the budget workshop when we look at that state bulletin 1014. The budget this year continues to reflect that pattern that has emerged um, and been our tradition over the past couple of years. When you're looking at our expenditure changes and we're breaking them down based on the amendment that you're going to see this evening based on um, the initial budget I'm reading to you tonight, there's a number here that might catch your eye. Phil, you like to pull out these small details, so I'll hit one for you. We are anticipating salaries to go up. That shouldn't surprise anyone because of the raises and the steps but we're actually showing a decrease in the benefits that's your UAL kicking in, right? When those are going down, that's where those rates are becoming offset. And there's a couple other variants in here that you're gonna see. You'll see a decrease in supplies and a decrease in capital outlay. Um, a lot of that are things that we were able to buy with ESSER 3 and 11 T dollars. Also, um, because of the accounting world and how they try and make our life extremely difficult, we have to book costs now for long-term items. So when we make software purchases, we have to book all of those costs now. And when we lease our new robotics center, I have to show all of those costs in our 2324 books. It looks different. Um, it doesn't really affect your bottom line, but when you see those major changes in categories, that's why. And the other thing I'd like to point out is your very bottom line and your outgoing transfers where you see the difference between the 4.2 and the 2.2 million. Brad, that is the fund modification that's coming to you later on in your budget amendment. Again, 
This budget does not have that fund modification. The current budget that we're in right now will have that fund modification. Salaries and benefits this year are slated to gain 5.2% of your expenditures. When all the numbers crunch down, you're going to see an, a decrease in both our budgeted revenues and both our budgeted expenditures. This was anticipated. We knew with losing the ESSER 3 and 11 t dollars that would happen. With the UAL rates changing, we knew that that would happen as well too. Um, at our June estimate, which you're gonna see in more detail later on in the agenda, we are estimating that this year we're gonna finish about $160,000 to the good. I urge you to just hear that number once and then forget it. Because remember I said, if I have a 1% variance on top of that, $160,000 turns into $1.3 million, just like that. So we bring these in conservatively for you. We had in our estimate for you in March for this current budget, a surplus of $2.3 million. You will see a fund modification coming to you later in the agenda. We're gonna shift $2 million into our capital improvement funds, hence your change in um, anticipated surplus there. Again, our fund balance that's captured by variance will affect these numbers. For our original budget, we're again predicting about $104.5 million, $104 million in revenues, $110.9 million expenditures. That comes in at about $6.3 million um, under. And if we have a historic budget variance coming in at 2.2, that shows us right around the $4 million as a deficit. Um, again, we bring you conservative budgets. Um, these conservative budgets do not show many of the revenues that we believe that we are going to have for the year. We like to come back to you in March and show you positive adjustments like we've done in all of the five years that I've been in this chair and many of the years that Mr. Cooper was in the chair as well too. But we like to paint a realistic picture that if the budgets come in as predicted and we spend all of the dollars that we plan to in a year, this is where your lines look. This shows and reflects a commitment to continuing staffing level and services at the exact same rate that we were during COVID. And if need be, and our revenues don't increase as we predict that they will, um, we would use a little bit of our fund balance to be able to provide those extra services during this time while we are still amplifying for our students. Um, so we still have a very healthy fund balance. If you look at the bottom line, if all holds out true, which it will not, we would finish the year with about a $28.3 million or 25.5% general fund. Your fund balance history chart, take a Polaroid, put it on the fridge, and then throw it away um, in three weeks. Um, but there are two different lines here. Um, in this, the blue line is actual cash. And you can see that our cash has continued to go up over time. Um, and your dots that you see are your percentages. I've said time and time again, beware of the percentages because when you have surges in expenditures, the amount of cash that you have can go up. You have a surge in expenditures and your percentage can go down. So that does not concern me at all. You continue to have a very healthy fund balance in both cash and percentage. And if this budget does hold true, you would still be in the top quartile of all school districts in the state in terms of your net position. Again, we believe that this is a conservative estimate and that we as a school district will likely figure better than where we are right now. Another slide that this is where Linda Klein, if you remember that name would come out and be mad at me if I didn't include it. Um, this is just a simple reminder so this history doesn't go away. The promise of Proposal A was that student funding would keep up with the rate of inflation. And so you can see that over time that if Proposal A and the per pupil allotment had kept up with the rate of inflation as was originally promised, we would have approximately $4,000 more per student than we are right now. While we are grateful to be getting increases, um, the original intention of Proposal A um, sometimes is subject to the ebb and flow of the economy, and sometimes the original intention of what the school aid fund diverts a touch. Never forget that the original intention of the school aid fund was to go to K-12 schools, and a very significant portion of that now goes to fund colleges and universities as well, too. Um, so there are a lot of different variances in there, and we continue on our end to advocate for every single discretionary dollar to be able to come to our schools so we can do what our teams think is best for our students. With that, I will wrap this portion of the presentation up and entertain any questions for you with a promise bill that I'll look at that chart for you and get back with you when I have some documents in front of me to be able to get you that answer. Any questions?
questions from board members or comments? Brian, one of the numbers that dropped pretty significant year over year was our capital expenditures. Do you have any concerns about that over the long term? I do not. Brian, what percentage of uh, the proposal A money is our colleges and universities getting? I'm going to stare at Penny um, and perhaps Ken. Um, <laughs> if, if you have that, that note changes every single year. Um, in my head, it's 8%. Um, but I'm saying that with a degree of confidence, it's not too high. Uh, I can go back and pull that for you because I know exactly what presentation it is. And I'm sure Penny will get that to you in a Friday letter coming up as well, too. Okay. And before proposal A, they didn't, colleges and universities didn't. They were not funded were not by the funded. way that this was set up. Okay. All right. Thank you. Proposal A was supposed to divert all of the funds to that formula to K-12. And over time, many things has happened to that foundation. And it, getting robbed is a very drastic term to say, but those funds have been diverted to away from what their original stated intent was. Any other questions? I think if the public takes anything away from this presentation, what I want it to be is that despite the district seen a drop in five million dollars year over year because of the loss of federal funds from ESSER and 11T. We have not only kept services to students, we've actually increased services to students. So we've kept all of our ESSER programming, doubled the amount of literacy coaches in early elementary, and figured out in our budget how to cover the $5 million drop in revenues. We should be extremely proud as a district of what we've done to manage that budget. Um, we've set ourselves up for success over the long term. And you can see where we're at from a general fund standpoint that we can cover that for the long term. So I'm extremely proud of what this board and our leadership team as a whole has done to manage us through this opportunity that we had to learn about what programs we could add for services to our students um, to get the results that we wanted such that we can manage those programs and keep what worked and then had the budget room to actually keep those programs and add to them um, once that federal funding went away. So thank you to our leadership team on the work that's been done over the last three, four years. It's, uh, we should all be really proud of the work that you've done. So, thanks. All right. Um, so 2.2 sounds like the same um, same action or same agenda item, but for information, Brian's going to specifically pull out just the tax rates. So Brian, 2.2 public hearing just on the uh, general operating budget and tax rates. Sure. Um, as you said, Phil, and I will reiterate, um, the intent of listing this separately is to ensure that the two intentions of the truth in budget and taxation hearings are met. Um, sometimes I think people felt like we just skimmed through the millage rates, so we wanted to separate those out. So this is a repeat for the second time, and you will hear these for a third time later in the agenda. Um, the rates that will support the budget, the general fund budget that we presented to you tonight are 18 mils on the non-homestead property, 0 0.3885 mils as our hold harmless millage, and 2.95 mils on the bond. Um, for taxation purposes, if you live in the city, those will be split in half, half on the summer, half on the winter. If it's an odd number, we put that extra tenth or thousandth on the summer versus the winter. And if you are in an out county or in one of the townships, all of those get assessed in the winter. And you will be asked twice to approve resolutions regarding these. Once later on in the agenda for the city, and then at the July Board of Education meeting, you'll get a fancy form called the L4029, which will establish these rates officially um, that we can send to the county assessor to be able to take care of all the winter taxes. But we have to do the cities this evening because they need those tax rates to be able to get the rolls ready to be able to send out to all of our tax orders. Taxpayers. Thanks, Brian. Thank you. All right. Item three, a request to address the board 
in the public hearing of the 24-25 general operating budget and tax rates. <clears throat> Item four is the consent agenda. So that completes our portion of the truth and taxation part of the meeting. We'll move into the general meeting. Item 4.1, approval of the minutes from the May 20th, 2024 regular meeting. Item 4.2, the below staff are being recommended for hire as listed in your agenda packet. Item 4.3, are teachers attaining tenure status as listed in your agenda packet. Item 4.4, the below staff announce a resignation on, a, on the effective dates listed in your agenda packet. Item 4.5, or approval of the payment of the school system's bills for the month of April 2024 as listed in the check registers prepared by Ms. Holderby in the amount of $14,270,612, which are recommended. The distribution of obligations by fund is included in the documentation. And finally, item 4.6, approval is requested to authorize legal payments to the below list of professional legal fees as listed in your agenda packet. Entertain a motion for approval of the consent agenda. So moved. Motion by Hatfield, support by Lauterbach. Any discussion? All in favor of approving the consent agendas, item 4.1 through 4.6, say aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion carries. Item five, our request to address the board. Ken is with us. Thank you. You told me to pause too. I'm sorry. <laughs> I was just going to say a few yes. words to the board. Welcome, Ken. Over to the mic, please. Over to the mic, okay. Ken is our new associate superintendent of curriculum and instruction and assessment. Okay. Yeah, well, thank you. First of all, I'd like to thank you for the honor of being able to join Midland Public Schools. Looking forward to it. It has quite a, quite a vast and extensive reputation as being quite a powerhouse in many aspects, not just uh, academics, but athletics and in many different areas as well. So I'm very deeply honored to be able to join. Uh, just a quick little bit about my background. Grew up in Hale, uh, attended the, uh, was I proud Hale Eagle? Um, way back, I won't tell you when I graduated, um, but uh, from there I went to Central, graduated in history, uh, graduated at a time when they said, hey, just get a major, it doesn't really matter, there's going to be plenty of openings. Well, I then found out it was a little tougher than that, and so I ended up spending about 10 years in Utah, was out there for supposedly one year, ended up staying almost 10 years, uh, coached and taught out there, was asked to join uh, administration and did so. Um, and then at that point did a 360, I guess, so to speak. And uh, my parents had been sending me uh, job postings for back here in Michigan um, and saying, is it about time I had gotten married? We had a child on the way and this, you know, happened to say they'd be great grandparents and everything else. And so my wife and I packed up and we moved back to Michigan. I spent uh, two years in Sturgis, Michigan and as a middle school AP. And then at that point, my wife said, we need to be closer to your family. If we're gonna be back here, we were about three hours away. Um, and so we moved over to Oxford. I became the assistant principal at Oxford High School. I was there for three years, and after three years, I was promoted to be the middle school principal. I was there for eight years, just thoroughly loved it. Um, it was just a, an honor to be the principal of such a fine staff and such a fine community at the, the middle school. And then at that point, the superintendent asked me to step up and be the assistant superintendent of curriculum instruction the same exact job that you are now or have approved me for tonight. So I'm honored to be in that. I was in that position for eight years uh, up until um, March of 2022 um, after the tragedy. Um, I was then promoted to be the superintendent. I was in that position until about November, at which time um, due to everything that happened on that date, um, just so you know, I ended up in the building that day. Um, and at that point, I took time to take care of myself. I had not taken time at all during that time. I organized the return to school, the return to learning, and everything else. 
notes and realized that I had not taken time for myself and at that point took a leave. Uh, spent a stretch of time uh, recovering, I guess, so to speak, and then I took the year and I wanted to be and have been the uh, Bay City Central High School athletic director and uh, assistant principal, working with kids directly. Did that, it was a great experience, fantastic, loved every minute of it, but I also realized that I needed to be true to what I love, and what I love to do is uh, improve systems and improve academics. And one night I just happened to be scrolling along and I saw this position, and I'm honored to say that this is the only position I applied for. Otherwise, I was all set to come back and, and at, uh, at Bay City Central, and uh, luckily I uh, was honored to, to get the so I tonight. So I appreciate it. And I'm sure look forward to getting to know all of you personally and working with you. Welcome. Thank you. Welcome. Thank you. I'll just add, if I might, Anna uh, Womack was approved tonight as well as our associate superintendent. Um, finance facilities and operations. She apologizes for her absence. She had a prior commitment with her family. So on her behalf, she wanted me to extend that she too is very excited to join the team and looks forward to meeting you all soon. Thanks. Now on to item five, request to address the board uh, for public comment. First up on the list, I had Renita Bonadies. Good evening. I've done the Freedom of Information Act FOIA and 18.234 in several of the previous meetings. I've questioned fees, accounting for time, and compliance with this law. Let me explain for the public what it is that I've been requesting. The meeting agenda packet is simply a copy of the file and information that is provided to the school board members before the meetings. It's already prepared and collated and made available as a document. I have been billed and paid $670 to receive the agenda packets, and I just received a fee statement for an additional $185.76 for my previous six-month subscription that just ended. In my invoice, there is a charge for 15 minutes for the FOIA coordinator to locate and receive this email information. In your mind, 15 minutes is not to be billed, it is to be rounded down. I'm not sure how it can take that long to receive and open an email. I have also been view, billed to comments and redact any personal information. For the record, there is almost nothing that can be redacted in these documents. I do find that random addresses are redacted, but according to the law, are not allowed to be redacted in S, sections three and four. Two of the agenda packets billed half an hour for redacting. One had two addresses redacted, the other had two redactions. These are documents due to find quotes for work to be done, presentations, contracts, insurance policies, and the like, but those are not things that can be redacted. In this fee bill, I was charged for the February 20th, 26th, and 28th in the amount of 2085 each. The only thing that was emailed to me was a copy of the meeting agenda. FOIA law is very clear in Section 5. If the public body directly or indirectly administers or maintains an official internet presence, any public records available to the general public are exempt from any charges. So what was I billed? I just received my FOIA fees for the next six months and for the meeting agenda packets. The previous subscription was 114.68. This subscription came in at 305.64. I guess the freedom of information has really gone up in price the past six months. And I would like to remind the public that the board members, that their employee, the superintendent, is responsible for this process for the district according to bylaws and procedures. She does have the ability to delegate, delegate responsibility, is still the one that drives this relationship with the public. The question is, are you building transparency and a bridge with the public, or are you building a higher wall? By the way, the FOIA law is only 14 pages stood by all elected public servants. Thank you. Next on the list is Joe Bonadies. Greetings. 
you were still operating under Robert's Rules of Order and the public had any standing at these meetings, I would have called point of order at the last meeting. Your long-standing excuses for having closed subcommittee meetings is that you make no decisions at these meetings. And when sorting multiple proposals, you always take the lowest. Shirters and do-overs make that a good thing, but that's what you've said. So at the last meeting, Mr. Bruton disclosed that on two occasions, your lowest cost bid was disqualified as they were deemed not capable of doing the work. I applaud the idea of having a qualifying step in accepting bid but it is, does put a chink in your armor on why the subcommittee meetings are closed. Second topic. It's been really quiet on the planning for the upcoming mechanism issue so far. I see that you spent over $20,000 planning for the school millage before flyers and postage, so no action so it should seem normal. Uh, you started spending money for consultants seven months before the vote on that. So my question is either, one, is the bureaucracy running plans for the bond issue behind your back? Or two, is the board working in the background with no transparency? Or three, you have started and you think the economy will be great in 2025 and this will be smooth sailing. By the way, your statements on the millage renewal were a little misleading regarding not a tax increase. The millage went down, that particular one, but the bonds, my assessment goes 5% both of the last two years, so we are spending money, and it's money out of pocket, not the rate. The same will hold true for the bond issue, more money at the end of that period. Don't overestimate the trust the public has in NPS. Thank you. Anybody else wish to address the board at this time? Item six, Board of Education Matters, presentation to the board. Item 6.1 for action, the 2324 final budget amendment. Brian. Thank you. Uh, while Dave's getting that queued up, I've done some button clicking for you here. Um, Mr. Hatfield, it's approximately $1 billion, or so about 5%. Um, and that's split between community college and higher ed, pretty okay. much about 50 okay. um, And then Phil, the reason why is because one of those included the $122 of the whole harmless and the other did not. Okay. That's what throws those percentages Thanks. off. So um, thank you for the time to be able to take a look at those. Um, so as said before, um, you kind of got a preview of this because you saw some of my June numbers in that previous presentation. So I promise you this will be much shorter. Um, and only have a couple of slides for you. So in your timeline, I don't need to reiterate this for you. You know that this is our final adjustment to our um, current fiscal year budget. Um, and I will give you disclaimers on this as well, too, because these are important to point out. We had to lock in every single one of these numbers on June the 4th in order to be able to prepare all of the paperwork for you in the presentation this evening. And um, frankly, a lot can happen in a month. Um, if you had a chance to, thank you, Mr. Dizek, read your Friday letter. We got a surprise last week um, in our food service funds and received a check for about $186,000 one week and received about a $60,000 increase for food service a couple of days later. We appreciate all of those revenues. Um, those are not reflected in this budget amendment that you see because again, we had to lock things in. So a lot of things change and know that if we are off in our variance of 1% in this current budget, it's about $1.16 million. So again, these numbers, we are trying to make as close as we possibly can for you, but no, we always do build this conservatively as well too. It's important for us to say, if we miss a line in any of this, in any of our budget, which has thousands of lines, and we don't have enough allocated in a certain line, it's a write-up in our audit, so we always guess up, which is why our variance comes in a little bit higher for you, more realized savings because of our conservative estimates. This amendment does include fund modifications. This will show you a $2 million transfer um, from this year's allocations into our capital improvement fund. And it also includes transferring money from our unassigned fund balance, our just piggy bank, to assigned areas of our fund balance, such as future technology purchases and bus replacements. 
For history for the board, I say this in the budget workshop, but it's important to say it again. We have three categories that we have been committed to assigning dollars to. One was copier replacements when the bond was expired. Our goal was to get to a million. We did that last year. We're no longer putting money into it because we are. Technology, you can't get to a high enough number um, because technology is always, always going to be a reoccurring cost. We've committed to putting a quarter of a million dollars away a year. This final budget adjustment changes money from our unassigned to our assigned to the tune of a quarter million dollars to technology and bus replacements. We do the same, but at $200,000 a year. So you have a thousand, you have a million dollars assigned for copiers. You have now 1.75 million total for technology and $800,000 total for bus replacements at the expiration in your assigned portion of your fund balance. We'll spend just a little bit of time in the numbers and I'll point out that there's not very many substantive changes from what was presented to you in March at Amendment 1. Revenues, you see that they have increased approximately $730,000. And expenditures, you see an increase of about $3.4 million. The $3.4 million comes out with really three major items. One is your $2 million transfer to your capital improvements that gets booked as an expenditure. That's the largest portion of it. And we also had to book our software agreements and also our full entire cost of the lease as well too for the robotics center. So when you add all of those together, it makes up the largest portion of your increase in expenditures. And you can see that our predicted surplus was at about $2.25 million at the March amendment. And now you can see that we are predicting, excuse me, about $2.8 million. And you can see that we are now predicting around 160,000. And if you just take your capital improvements transfer away from that, it really kind of zeroes you out and shows you where the bottom line is. Our anticipated general fund balance, if all of these numbers hold true at the end of this fiscal year, will be right at about $32.5 million or just shy of 28%. Again, Yo and Yo will be here. The pre-audit starts next week. The full audit starts the third week of July. They will go through, we will chew up our books, we will capture all of our final variants, and Yo and Yo will report back to you in the very early fall on what our final net position is. We're hoping the numbers come in just a touch better than what our conservative projections are for you this evening. With that, I'm happy to take any questions on our very final budget amendment of this fiscal year. Any questions for Brian? Take a motion for item 6.1. I'll move to approve uh, item 6. Point, actually, yeah, item 6.1, sorry. Support. Motion by McFarland. Support by Ringel. Any further discussion or questions? All in favor of the 23-24 final budget amendment, say aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion carries. Item 6.2 for action, approval of the 24-25 general operating budget, Brian. Unless you'd like to hear that whole presentation again, which I'm happy to deliver for you, but I'm sure um, <laughs> you guys have gotten a good sense of the numbers. Um, but this is now the official action that we have gone through our official truth in budget and taxation hearing. And we've offered the opportunity for the public co to comment. Now it's time for the board to be able to take action on adopting the 24-25 general operating budget. Take a motion for item 6.2. Move to approve 6.2 approval of the 24-25 general operating budget. Support. Motion by Ringgold, support by Hatfield. Any further discussion or questions? All in favor of item 6.2 approval of the 24-25 general operating budget. Say aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion carries. Item 6.3 for action, Michigan High School Athletic Association approval, uh, Penny. Good evening, yes, we have for your consideration tonight uh, our standard agreement, the resolution for us to uh, maintain our membership with the Michigan High School Athletic Association by agreeing to this. We're essentially agreeing to abide by all of their uh, rules, regulations, and bylaws. Uh, this is standard. Uh, you all have reviewed this and have historically approved this for many, many years. 
entertain a motion for item 6.3. So moved. Support. Motion by Hatfield, support by McFarland. Any further discussion? I had a couple comments. Um, there have been different groups and different movement, movements over the years, many, many years, of uh, people trying to identify and talk about um, the parochial schools and the private schools and the playoff systems and things that are derived how those populations, how those counts, how they state in those schools, bracket, all the above. Um, I just wanted to share a couple things with you um, of some statistical data of where this stands at the moment. So um, there is a resolution that was out there a handful of years ago. Um, I just wanted to share some of the numbers of it, and I think this is pretty still very accurate today that the private schools represent just about 8% of all MHSAA member schools, but they are winning 30% of the state titles, more than three times as many as they statistically should. Also, the private schools win 42% of the state titles in the lower half of the divisions of the MHSAA playoffs, more than five times as many as they statistically should. And some of those numbers, which Scott will probably attest to this, Boys and cross, 64% of the time. Oh, yeah. Hockey, 57% of the time. Boys soccer, 55%. Girls soccer, 55%. Boys golf in the Lower Peninsula, 49%. Volleyball for the ladies, 46%. Girls tennis, 43%. Boys tennis, 41%. Football at 40%, and baseball at 40%. Some of them go down from there. So there still is an issue out there. Um, MHSAA has chosen not to do anything about it at this point in time. I think that it is gaining momentum again, and I think that we will be potentially asked to join. And um, I'm going to read you. Asked to join what? Asked to join a. Um, I'll read it. How's that? It's, okay. a res it's a resolution that they would ask us to adopt. Who would ask us to? This group that is asking people to give a voice to all schools on how playoffs are derived, that we get a vote. Okay. That it's not just determined by MHSAA, the school districts would also have a say okay. as well. Okay. okay. Thank you. Brad, can I ask, is this, yeah. um, you're sharing this for information to for the board? Okay. I am not making a resolution. I am just sharing some information. Um, the fair playoffs resolution I'm going to say of, would be of any school district. In our case, it would be middle public schools, but I'm not making a resolution. Whereas private schools represent just 8% of all NHS AA member schools, but win 30% of the state titles, more than three times as many as statistically should. Whereas private schools win 42% of the state titles in the lower half of the divisions of the NHS AA playoffs, more than five times as many as they statistically should. Whereas we believe NHS AA playoff systems should be fair have as much competitive balance as possible. Therefore, let it be resolved that said school district supports the opportunity for MHSAA member schools to vote on whether or not a competitive balance plan should be implemented for all MHSAA playoffs. Therefore, let it be resolved that said school district believes that if the majority of the MHSAA member schools support instituting a competitive balance plan the member school should be provided an opportunity to vote on the exact plan to be implemented. So, for information only, just wanted to share with you that there is a definite imbalance, and as Scott well knows, the cross is at the top of the list, and um, it'd be nice to have a balance. That's all I'm asking is that it should be fair and it should be competitive year after year. Thanks for sharing that. We will check in with our athletic directors. Jeff and I can do that. And uh, should that come to fruition, we can bring that up through our study committee uh, structure and then bring it to the board for consideration. Okay. Thanks. Mm -hmm. Any further discussion on 6.3?
All in favor of item 6.3, approval of the MHSAA bylaws, say aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay, motion carries. Item seven is curriculum instruction and assessment. 7.1, our CIA study committee minutes from May 20th, 2024. CIA study committee minutes. We met on May 20th, 2024. Members present were Brad Blazy, Ann Horowitz, uh, was not Jennifer Ringgold, it was Phil Rausch, substituting for Jennifer. Penny Miller Nelson, Jen Service, Melissa Toner, Melissa Ahern, Joy, and we met at the Carpenter Pre-Primary Center. We discussed play-based learning. The committee gained an understanding of the play-based learning approach used at the Pre-Primary Center and visited multiple classrooms to see the learning in action. Kindergarten Camp. The committee learned about the Kindergarten Camp concept being used throughout the district for the start of the 24-25 school year. Diversity, equity, and inclusion update. An update was provided about DEI activities throughout the district. A June workshop is being planned for district culture and climate leaders. The meeting adjourned at 2.45 p.m. Thanks, Brad. Item 7.2, for action, textbook adoption, Penny. Yeah, if I might just comment on 7.1 quick. That was a really wonderful uh, CIA meeting. Uh, Melissa Ahern did a great job planning some interactive activities for our committee members. I just want to offer quickly the kindergarten camp concept that we're scaling across the district was wildly successful at the pre-primary center for this current year. Uh, if you're not yet familiar with that, uh, I can share more information with the board soon. Essentially, for the first two weeks of school, which will be eight days because we have two short weeks those first weeks, uh, students in kindergarten in all of our schools uh, will not be assigned to a homeroom yet. They will rotate through. They'll be put in camps, which are a fun uh, way for students to identify with their group. This is a chance for them to really build a sense of community across all uh, kindergarten classrooms and then for us to really get a sense of where the students might fit best in terms of attachment uh, to their peers and to teachers and really balance those classes out. This will be different for our families. We will over communicate uh, just to assure them that things are going well, and then they'll be placed in their uh, permanent kindergarten classroom, their homeroom, uh, that second week of school, and we'll get them all switched over uh, in our synergy system. We're really excited about it. Our kindergarten teachers are excited about it, so you know you've hit something good when the teachers are excited as well. Okay, 7.2. Will that be at all of the elementary schools? Ever, all of them are doing it? It will, and actually, uh, Jen, I'll just offer um, Brian's looking at me because Brian and Jeff and I were all thinking we would scale this slowly. So from the pre-primary, maybe find two additional elementaries, really prove that it's working well. And there was such enthusiasm by kindergarten teachers and principals that they all wanted to be in. And at that point, okay, we're all in. Okay, 7.2. Uh, we are back for your consideration of two textbooks. These were presented to you for information at our last board meeting. One is for our building trades and advanced building trades courses. It is the core instruction to basic construction skills by Pearson. And this is uh, directly aligned with the industry certification that's required now through Perkins le legislation for our CTE programs. The second text is for AP um, excuse me, IBAP Advanced Physics uh, 2, and the title of that is Physics for Scientists and Engineers, a Strategic Approach with Modern Physics, and that is also a Pearson product, copyright 2022. Thanks, Brian. Take a motion for approval of item 7.2. So moved. Support. Motion by Lauterbach, support by McFarland. Any further discussion or questions on the two texts? for approval in item 7.2. All in favor of approving 7.2, say aye. 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 Any opposed? Item eight, finance facilities and operations, 8.1, FFO study committee minutes from June 3rd, 2024. Thank you, Phil. 
Uh, the committee met on June 3rd. Uh, members present were Brad Blazy, Penny Miller Nelson, Brian Brutin, Jennifer Ringgold uh, attended as a substitute. The committee discussed the April financials. Revenues, expenditures, and transactions above the bid threshold were provided. There were no significant variances of note. Workers' compensation renewal. The administration will recommend renewing coverage with the Yiter Insurance Agency. This is the fourth renewal of the policy. Property and casualty insurance renewal. The administration will recommend renewing coverage with SETSEG. This is the fourth renewal of the policy. Dust collector replacement. The administration will recommend awarding a contract to replace the dust collector in the wood shop at Midland High School. Capital improvement funds will be utilized if approved. Administration center furniture. The administration will recommend awarding a contract to replace furniture in the boardroom and other various locations within the administration center. Capital improvement funds will be utilized if approved. Budget adoption protocol. Protocols for the June 13th Board of Education meeting were reviewed. The meeting will open with the truth in budgeting and taxation hearing. Action items in the regular meeting will include the final 23-24 budget amendment, 24-25 salary letter, 24-25 budget, and tax rates for the City of Midland Summer Collection. Finally, the July FFO meeting date was discussed. The committee discussed the potential cancellation of the July meeting. This meeting has historically been canceled or rescheduled due to the proximity to the July 4th holiday. Next meeting date to be determined. Thanks, John. Item 8.2 for action, the 24-25 salary letter. Brian. Thank you, Phil. Um, included in your agenda packet was our proposed 2425 salary letter. This includes salary rates for every single affiliated or bargaining group within the middle of public schools, but also for our non-affiliated groups as well, too. Um, those salaries were reflected in the 2425 budget in which you just adopted. And we are looking for your official approval of those rates. Um, again, some of those are contractually obligated. Others are for non-affiliated groups. This will put, officially put those rates into play for the 24-25 school year. I entertain a motion for item 8.2. So moved. Support. Motion by McFarland, support by Ringgold. Any discussion on 8.2? All in favor of approving the 24-25 salary letter say aye. 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 Any opposed? 8.3 for action, approval of the summer tax rate. Brian. Thank you. This is the third repeat of the same rates that you've heard this evening. Um, but within the resolution that is included in your board packet, this is for, again, the City of Midland only. And it asks for the City of Midland to assess half of the full rates that you saw um, in the presentation this evening. So it will ask for an assessment of nine of the 18 non-homestead mills. 0.1943 of the whole 0.3885 hold harmless mills and 1.475 of the 2.95 bond mills on the summer tax collection. So we are asking for your um, support this evening of a resolution to ask the city of Midland to approve those summer tax rates. Thanks. Thank you, Brian. Uh, entertain a motion for 8.3. Support. Motion by Lauterbach, support by Horowitz. Any further discussion or questions on 8.3? Okay, Mr. Hatfield, can you do roll call vote for Absolutely. us, please? Uh, President Rausch? Yes. Vice President McFarland? Yes. Secretary Hatfield is yes. Treasurer Lauterbach? Yes. Member Blazy? Yes. Member Ringgold? Yes. Member Horowitz? Yes. All in favor? Thank you. Item 8.4 for action, workers' compensation insurance. Brian. Thank you. We are asking and recommending approval this evening of renewing our workers' compensation coverage policy. This is through the Yider Insurance Agency that is located here in Midland. This is the fourth renewal of the policy, and the renewal rate for the 24-25 coverage is $82,583. Go ahead. Adoption of 8.4 renewal of the workers' compensation. Support. Motion by Lauterbach, support by McFarland. Any discussion on 8.4? All in favor of approving the workers' compensation insurance for 
for $82,583. Say aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion carries 8.5 property and casualty insurance renewal. Brian. Thank you. We are also recommending that we renew our current provider of our property and casualty insurance. This is through Set SAG out of East Lansing, Michigan. The total for this coverage is $359,518. This coverage expires on June 30, and this covers us all the way out and through July 1 of 25. This is the fourth renewal of this policy, and complete details were provided for you in the board packet. Entertain a motion for 8.5. I move approval of item 8.5. Second. Motion by Hatfield, support by Ringgold. Any discussion on 8.5? All in favor of item approving 8.5, renewal of the property and casualty insurance, say aye. 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 Any opposed? Item 8.6 for Action Administration Center Furniture Purchases. Brian. I'm waiting for a smile to come from Penny on this one because she's been asking for this for years. And, well, she's the superintendent now, so we, can, we moved on these. Um, I, I think we can all agree it's been a long time coming to replace the furniture within this boardroom. That does not include your chairs, but you've heard for years this squeaking. Um, these are quite heavy, and while those are quite nostalgic and vintage, um, I can tell you from experience, they're not quite the most comfortable things to be able to sit on. So um, we did have a little bit left in our capital improvements budget this year, and it is a priority for the not just comfort of our audience participants, but we do a lot of professional development in this spot, and moving these tables has become a burden for our EnviroClean. We're getting new furniture that is mobile, has wheels. Um, we'll provide a much better learning environment. There'll also be some replacement of some of the lounge furniture around, even within um, our break room as well, too. So we are recommending this evening to issue a purchase order to Grand River Office of Muskegon, Michigan. Um, the total amount is $51,966.84. This will use capital improvement funds, and the pricing was um, gathered through the regional Omnia contract, which does follow board purchasing policies. Take a motion for approval of item 8.6. I'll move for the approval of item 8.6. Support. Motion by McFarland, support by Horowitz. Any further discussion on 8.6? Just curious of timeline. When do you, when is, do you I sure hope by the fall. Okay. <laughs> And Brian, just to relate it back to an earlier uh, item that we approved, I assume this may potentially reduce our workers' comp claims. I hope so. We all come running when we hear these things scraping because it scrapes at the carpet, it's heavy, and if you'd like to, no, don't pick one of these up because we just renewed our insurance. I don't want rates to go up, but it is time, and we appreciate your consideration. All in favor of item 8.6, Administration Center Furniture Purchase, say aye. 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 Any opposed? Item 8.7 for action, dust collector, Brian. Thank you. Bids were solicited to replace the dust collector that is in the wood shop over at Midland High School. We included the specifications of the project in your board packet. We are recommending that we grant this project to Rolls Mechanical of Fenton, Michigan. Uh, they had the low bid of $91,000, and if we have your approval this evening, capital improvement funds will be utilized to replace the dust collector over at Midland High. Thank you, Brian. Take a motion for 8.7. Move to approve the purchase of dust collector. Support. Motion by Ringgold, support by Hatfield. Any further discussion? Why oh. is this one so much cheaper than uh, high bid? Do you have any insights? Two of the bids were real close. One was a touch higher. Um, I don't have insights. I can try and gather them from Mr. Mogenberg for you as he met with all those contractors. We've had good luck with roles. They've done good work for us and hopefully they'll do the same for us on this project. All in favor of approving 8.7, say aye. 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 Any opposed? Item 8.8 .8 for information, gifts totaling $18,266.10. Thank you. For information only, as you pointed out, we wish to acknowledge 27 total gifts. The grand total on that was $18,266.10. They represent a wide range of items, ranging from supports for athletic teams, media center books, the BPA, and also robotics. And as is our tradition, 
All gifts will be acknowledged in the broadcast credits of this meeting and also through board correspondence. We express our gratitude to all of our very generous donors. <coughs> yes, thank you. Item nine, human resources section. Uh, note that the study committee has not met since our last uh, board meeting, so therefore no committee minutes. Item 9.1 for information, uh, Jeff. Thanks, Bill. The below staff member uh, has announced their retirement uh, with the effective date listed. And so from the Midland Federation of Paraprofessionals, uh, Ms. Judith Kanopic uh, has retired her para position from H.H. Dow High School, and that was um, effective May 31st, 2024. And I can continue on yep. 9-2. Um, the board and staff also extend their sympathy to the families of the following past employees. First, Ms. Janet Northrup. Uh, she passed away May 27th, 2024. Janet was employed uh, first as a physical education teacher here in the district. Then she was an administrative assistant at H.H. Dow High School. Later, coordinator of health and physical education for the district. And then she ended her career as the assistant principal at Midland High School, where she worked uh, for 15 years up until her retirement in 1998. She retired with 36 years of service. And then lastly, um, our condolences to the family of Miss Nancy Noreen Miski. Uh, she passed away May 28th, 2024. She was employed as an administrative assistant in various positions around the district, including uh, time even as Board of Ed assistant and assistant to the assistant superintendent and then later uh, an assistant to the director of finance. She retired in 2005 with 41 years of service. Wow. <clears throat> Thanks, Jeff. Item 10 are correspondence to and from the Board of Information Education. Uh, item 10.1 for information letters from the Board of Education to the following uh, organizations listed in the agenda packet. <clears throat> Item 11 are scheduled activities for information. All regular and special meetings of the Board of Education begin at 7 p.m. and are listed as noted in the agenda packet with our next meeting scheduled for July 15th. Item number 12 uh, is the study session discussion. Are there points of clarification Item 12.1. Back to 11.1. Yep. Are we meeting July 15th? Yes. Okay. Because there was a mention in. Oh, that was FFO. That was, that was FFO. FFO. Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. Good. Good question, though. Yep. Is FFO meeting? At this if point. It is, I'm not Okay. <laughs> At this point, I, I think we don't have any agenda items uh, that are that time sensitive. Uh, I think in, in the last communication, we still listed it. Um, I'll confirm that next week via email uh, to FFO. Okay. Thank you. I was just going to make one point of clarification on st um, study committee. FFO, FFO doesn't disqualify any contractors. Okay. If a contractor is disqualified, it's because they don't meet one of four categories. Brian, help me out. Just keep me honest. If they don't have the appropriate bond insurance, if they don't meet the Iran sanctions list, Correct. safety initiative, yeah. family, and family relationship. Yes. So they can yes. self disqualify, which is what we mean by when we say that somebody was disqualified. Correct. And one kicker category sometimes of that is for the public school, we feel an obligation to meet our expectations. Right. But to follow up on the point, the state, you do diligence yes. the bids and determine who yeah. with Mike Mogenberg and you determine who qualifies. We don't do that in a committee meeting. That's correct. Thank you. I think that is an important distinction. Our study committees don't make decisions. Administration makes those recommendations. They're studied. Uh, you all have questions you might ask through the study committee process and then the recommendations are brought to the full board. Uh, based on administration's recommendation. All right. Item 12.2, announcements from Penny. I do have just a few. 
Uh, first off, if you know of uh, any families with kindergartners or children who are kindergarten age, please nudge them. Uh, as Brian said, we, um, we watch those numbers carefully. Uh, Becky Longstreth, our enrollment specialist, might be tired of me asking for the comparison charts from the previous few years. We're not, we're, we're on par with where we typically are. It's just always a little unnerving to know that we have those families that um, might not register until right before school comes. We want to be ready for all the children that we welcome in the fall. So please nudge uh, anyone that you know who has a kindergarten aged student. And pre-primary. And pre-primary. Thank you. Absolutely. We have some really great things happening in mm -hmm. our pre-primary center. I was excited for our uh, board study committee to visit. Is that going out on socials quite a bit? About it is, and I'll, uh, Dave and I can check with our communications team and make sure that that's on loop okay. through the summer. Thank you for that. I want to just take a moment to give some kudos to our admin team. Uh, the school year, of course, is out. However, uh, their work still continues. Last week, they spent a full day in Raider Reliability Training, which is a legal requirement now for those who do evaluations for teachers, and it was just a good day of learning. And then they were back for two days this week for adult learning principles. And this was a two-day session with an outside facilitator who just keeps pressing us to build our skills in providing quality learning experiences for our teachers and our staff. We talked about the different modes that we move into uh, to support teachers and students, from coaching to presenting to facilitating to consultation. And it was really special to feel the energy in the room, especially because it wasn't just our admin team, but we welcomed our lit specialist, our PYP coordinators, our learning coaches, our social emotional learning specialist, our admin mentees. I'm probably forgetting a group because uh, there was 60 people in the room really energized uh, with learning. So thank you to those who showed up and really um, actively participated. I think it's a testament to the fact that we, even as leaders, keep learning. We expect our students to learn, our teachers to learn, and we're doing the same. I also want to take a moment, uh, since it's June, and the next time we meet will be in the new fiscal year, kind of that moment of starting uh, the new school year, to publicly thank some folks. Melissa and Jen aren't with us tonight. Uh, they're with family, but you've noticed that they've been at every board meeting this year, and they have just stepped up in such a big way this year, given we didn't backfill the curriculum associate superintendent role. Uh, tremendous colleagues and partners this year really uh, countless hours that those two spent making sure that people had their needs met, keeping our process moving forward. They are both um, just terrific leaders who really work with integrity, and I am abundantly grateful for them. And then these two over here, uh, I feel the same. Uh, this year has been amazing in so many ways and also really challenging as uh, we've all picked up a little bit of extra work. And Brian and Jeff, are just the kind of colleagues you can always count on and really thankful for them. Thankful for you too. I'm acting like you're not here. Thank you. Mm -hmm. uh, and some extra things this year, you know, with the superintendent search process, the operating millage renewal, there was no shortage of work to be done. And there were lots of times where these two were in on the weekends, uh, early mornings and late nights. So thank you. And Sarah isn't here because she's in class tonight, but a quick thank you to her as well. I think she's done a really nice job supporting all of you as board members. Again, the superintendent search process and the operating millage renewal uh, was extra work for her, and I think she stepped into that very well on top of her day-to-day -day responsibilities. And Dave, who is our Sarah tonight, uh, Dave's a great utility player in addition to leading our tech team. Uh, he steps up whenever we need him to. So thank you, Dave. And thank you to the team behind the scenes here that makes sure our board meetings flow smoothly and are recorded for the public. So just lots of gratitude today uh, as we finish that out. Uh, Phil, my last comment might just be if, if the board should consider uh, amending the agenda mm -hmm. so that when we come out of closed session, there is an additional action item. Uh, regarding the performance objectives. Yes. Um, so what Penny and I talked about earlier today when she and I were going over the agenda was when we go into closed session, the intent to go into closed session, obviously, is that by statute, she has the, the right to request to go into closed session for her evaluation. 
We double checked with our attorney that part of the evaluation process because of the contract that we have for Penny for the superintendent uh, as part of our superintendent contract is both the evaluation and the merit performance goals for the following school year. So we'll do evaluation for 23-24 and set, we, can, we will discuss 24-25 merit uh, objectives. So at a minimum, we have item number 14 on the agenda packet, which is evaluate uh, action on the evaluation. When we come out, we can we can do one of two things. We can make a motion now to amend the agenda to add that we also take an action on the merit portion, or we can wait until July if people want a chance to think about it. People have a preference one way or the other. And you could also coming out of closed session. Yeah, we could amend after. Absolutely. Out of session. I just I know folks leave and they might not come back, yeah. and I just wanted to make sure they uh, understood what was happening after closed session. Since it's not on this agenda, yep. I think that nothing is going to happen with it. We can move it to July, and it is already sure. it, it's there. That's and, fine. Yep. Okay, we'll do that. All right, so the uh, we do have two agenda items left. Um, so one is to go into closed session for the evaluation, which Penny has requested. And then uh, once we come out of closed session, we will take action on her evaluation. So I'll make a motion that we go into closed session to consider the superintendent's personnel evaluation as permitted under MCL 15.268A. Second. Motion by Hatfield, support by McFarland. All right. Have Mr. Hatfield, yep. can you take a roll call vote? We'll take a roll call vote. Uh, President Roush. Yes. Vice President McFarland. Yes. Secretary Hatfield is yes. Treasurer Lauterbach. Yes. Member Blazy. Yes. Member Ringgold. Yes. Member Horowitz. Yes. All right. Okay. In closed session. Thank you. All right, we're back in open session. So <clears throat> moving out of closed session where we uh, deliberated on the superintendent's evaluation. So just to inform the public, for the superintendent evaluation process, the board uses the Michigan Association of School Boards Evaluation Tool which is research-based and approved by the Michigan Department of Education. The evaluation rubric includes five domains and uses a rating of one, which is low, to four, which is high, in the areas of governance and board relations, community relations, staff relations, business and finance, and instructional leadership. 
Per the current Michigan School Code, 60% of the summative evaluation is based on the domain rating, and the remaining 40% is based on a student growth metric that aligns with teachers and administrators in the district. Each domain rating is supported by evidence of the superintendent's performance and the achievements of the district. As board president, I met with Penny to discuss her performance for the 23-24 school year in alignment with the evaluation domains and the evidence listed. That information was shared with board members and during the closed session, the board deliberated on all aspects of Penny's evaluation. The evidence indicates that Penny's performance for the school year is aligned with the rating of four highly effective. I'll accept the motion for item 14, the superintendent's evaluation. So moved. Support. Motion by Hatfield. Support by Lauterbach. Any further discussion or comments? I just say thank you for the process and thank you for an amazing interim year. Thanks. Echo Jen's comments. Thank you for the interim year, especially as you and your team work through not having a uh, associate superintendent for curriculum and I know you and your team stepped up and and uh, backfilled that extremely effectively I think one of the things as the superintendent when you do your evaluation it, it's a reflection of not just you but your admin team and your staff and the systems in place that make this district great um, there's a reason that we're a top five percent district in the state and it's because of the leadership that we have in place and the systems that we have in place and the people behind you. So um, the highly effective rating is obviously you and your leadership, but it's also the great team behind you. So thank you to you and your team. Thank you. In the words of Dr. Seuss, oh, the places you'll go. <laughs> thanks, everyone. I already said my thanks to the team, but uh, you're right. It's a total team effort. Thank you. Uh, all in favor of the approving the four highly effective rating for Penny, say aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay. Motion carries. Accept a motion to adjourn. So moved. Support. Motion aye. by. <laughs> all in favor, say aye. 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 And.